Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. My name is Gray Jones, and I want to welcome you to the TV Writer Podcast, partner of Script Magazine, episode 56 for Friday, May 18th, 2012. Well, today I have an interview with producer, director, writer, and editor, Brandon David Cole. Um, boy, you're going to love this interview. Brandon is an amazing example. Boy, he produced, wrote, and sold three feature films in a row, um, which he uh, not only produced and wrote, but he directed and edited. And he's got great stories to share about how he made them happen. Um, wow. Three in a row sold. <laughs> Gotta say that again. And uh, he's also edited reality TV shows for MTV, VH1, Discovery, Spike, Speed, MSNBC, G4, Style, and E. And he's got advice for approaching reality TV um, as, a, as a writer and, and how the stories are written. Um, yes, we can say that, that reality TV has writers. And as well, another project that he has is he designs and sells camera mount systems. And uh, we have a lot of talk about why um, the, the camera mount systems are so inexpensive now and how you can take advantage of these and what you might be looking for. He's got some great advice as well for writing and shooting your own indie features or webisodes. So lots of great content in this interview. You're going to love it. Stick around after the interview because uh, this is production season and I have a mini interview with EVS Online, which is, uh, which is a provider of camera rentals and sales to the Los Angeles area, also nationally and internationally. And they've got great tips on how to approach your own indie productions, webisodes, and showcase work that you're going to plan to shoot this summer. So very, very cool stuff. You can find um, Brandon at MidasMount.com or on Twitter at MidasMount. So do look him up and, and find out all of the stuff that he does. And as well, don't forget to go to TVWriterPodcast.com for lots of great resources, including links to hundreds of free television scripts um, and pilots. And as well... There are there is a database of TV writers on Twitter with over 900 TV writers. Why wouldn't you want to take advantage of that? TVWriterPodcast.com. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Gray Jones as my handle. Now, my interview with Brendan David Cole. Enjoy. This is Gray, and I'm here with producer, director, writer, editor, Brandon David Cole. How are you doing, Brandon? Good. I'm doing good. Thanks, Ray. Uh, I really, really appreciate you coming on the podcast, and and uh, I know that you have your hands in a lot of different things, and I mm -hmm. think there's going to be something in here for everyone, um, because anybody who who watches this podcast loves making either movies or TV or writing. Um, we we just love telling stories in all the different forms, and mm -hmm. you've told in a lot of different forms. So so that's really I really wear cool. A lot of hats. Yeah. Um, but why don't, why don't we start way back? And uh, I I love uh, on your bio how how it talked about how you got started. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I was a competitive BMX freestyle rider as a teenager, and I would use my dad's two piece VHS camera mm -hmm. if. Uh, anyone is old enough to remember a two piece VHS camera. It was like the first consumer video camera that came out Yeah, and I would make BMX videos to promote myself as a rider and our BMX team to get sponsorships. Mm -hmm. but, um, eventually filmmaking became more of a passion for me than BMX riding. And I ended up at NYU film school mm -hmm. at, at, uh, at Tish. I, I almost went there. Um, tell me about the Tish program. The Tisch program is great because it's purely film school. It's, it's a lot of hands on uh, with the equipment. Mm -hmm. You're shooting, writing, directing, shooting, editing, producing every day. So it's really immersive. And, um, uh, you know, I, I'm grateful for the Tisch program for that, that I had so much access to equipment and I, and I was able to make so many films. Mm -hmm. Now, um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, they ha also have some co-op programs for the summers. Uh, I just remember reading about that somewhere. 
They do. And uh, I know a lot of a lot of foreigners do that. People that don't have access or can't enroll in a traditional bachelor or master's degree mm-hmm. do a um, like a filmmaking boot camp at Tisch for the summer. Mm-hmm. Cool. So now while you were there, you um, you began writing, directing and pro- producing and that continued after school. Tell me about that. Well, my goal was to make three feature films as a writer director by the time I was 30. And so when I left film school at 26 years old, wow. I, I worked for a year on big feature film sets and then went back to my hometown of Hartford, Connecticut and sort of pooled all my local resources and got everyone there in this sort of small city excited about making a movie and was able to do three feature films which uh, I wrote, directed, produced, and edited, and sold them all. Wow. Mm-hmm. And anybody who makes independent films, you know that uh, that just selling one is an amazing feat. And selling three of them, t- tell me about how, I mean, h- how did you go about it, and, h- and how did it happen, what, what, and what were the budgets like? I mean, three in a row, how could you afford these? Well, the first feature film we shot on 16 millimeter film Mm -hmm. and the budget was about 75,000. We sold it for 125,000 as a, as a, an upfront advance, which is unheard of now. Yeah. But at the time it was the era of, this was 1999, 2000. That was the era of blockbuster and Mm -hmm. Hollywood video and they needed content for their shelves. And the first film I did was um, a genre movie it was an, like an urban action film mm-hmm. uh, about a drug dealer financing his friend's hip-hop group so it had a lot of the elements that video stores were looking for mm-hmm. and um, the second one was also uh, it was a heist movie we shot it i shot it for fifteen thousand wow. dollars we sold it for forty five thousand again as a as an upfront guarantee mm-hmm. um and then those were sort of, I considered those my practice movies. Mm-hmm. And the third film I made, Bristol Boys, which I got a legitimate cast for and had a budget of $115,000 and about another 100000 in deferments. Mm-hmm. And by that time, this was 2004 we shot it, 2007 we, it was released. At that time, the, the brick and mortar video business was pretty much gone or going away. Wow. So we didn't get, we lost money on that film. Mm -hmm. So the video, that sort of selling your movie to the video store model had gone away by that time. Mm -hmm. And now you also got some, some grants for that. Or or I I remember I just watched it recently and I saw in the credits you were, um, you, there was a grant, some kind of a grant or something mentioned. That was, I won a, um, you had to submit your project, uh, your script and your sort of producer package. And I won a grant from Panasonic and Able Cinetech. Mm-hmm. That was worth, it was a one month rental of a, an entire camera package. Wow. And that sort of kickstarted the project because investors, people that put in hard cash knew that I already had free camera rental. Wow. That really helped get things going. Mm-hmm. Well, that's great. And, and now the, it was sort of, um, uh, it, I mean, three features in, in just a few years was great, but that wasn't your end goal. You'd achieved your goal now. The three, you, you, you did what you set out to do. So, mm-hmm. so what direction did you take at that point? Well, you know, I, I always said to myself, I'm going to make three feature films and they'll by and large be practice movies. And at that point I could sell my director, writer, director services to the Hollywood studios. And that didn't materialize, you know, as I had planned, Mm -hmm. but I ended up getting a career as an editor in reality television. Mm -hmm. And, uh, my experience writing the movies, I primarily, primarily wanted, wanted to be that director that goes to Sundance and wins all the awards. (laughs) But in order to do that, I needed to write my own movies. Mm -hmm. So with the goal of being a director, it was a necessity to be a writer Mm. and my writing experience on those movies helped me a lot in what I do now, which is edit and produce reality television. Mm -hmm. And which, as you know, um, in reality, they can't call us writers. Yeah. So they call us story producers. 
Yeah, or uh, predators. Right. Uh, so, so tell tell me then about. Um, I mean, you've you've edited now quite a few different shows. I mean, for M- MTV, VH1, Discovery, Spike, Speed, more documentary stuff, um, mm-hmm. and the more reality stuff. But through these these different shows that you've done, um, tell me about the writing process, both um, the writing that you have to do as you approach the material, and mm-hmm. some of the different ways that you work with the story producers. Um, yeah, when when you when you actually work hand in hand with them to to do the shows, well, in, in an extreme case, I worked on Flavor of Love, Rock of Love, I Love New York, all those really like trashy house reality shows for VH1. Mm-hmm. In, that, in that case, uh, there's such a a factory system where we have every word that was ever spoken on camera logged. <laughs> so if as a story producer, I need to um, have uh let's say for instance on one episode two girls in the house are really getting along well mm-hmm. reality but on the show we need to make them the worst enemies <laughs> so we'll take them into the garage at two in the morning for the interview yeah. when they're susceptible and suggest that their best friend was telling lies about them oh no like the story producer will actually sit there and, and say you know like according to my fake notes here your friend candy was you know talking about you behind your back and they'll say no no she wasn't that's not true yeah according to so and so and so and so she was she was talking about you and they'll you know will actually lie to the to the people who are on the show to get the response out of them wow and if that's not enough we'll take we'll fr- do what's called frank inviting mm-hmm. and i'll suggest exactly what i would like her to say in her interview, I heard Candy was talking behind my back and I'm going to go bitch slap her the next time I see her. Right. But she never said that in the interview. So the story editors will find all those words from her hours and hours and hours and hours of interview. And I'll splice them all together in a Frankenbite. Wow. And as a writer, editor, predator, make her say what she never said. So, so in, in that kind of, it, and now that doesn't necessarily res, um, res, that's not indicative of the the process for every show. Um, you mentioned these no. kind of more trashy shows. Uh, in that particular case, you're basically structuring it exactly how you want it structured. Now, um, other shows might take a, a slightly different tack. Uh, tell me a little bit about about those. Well, that's that's on a more trashy house reality show that I was talking about. It's mm-hmm. In the case of a um, a docu so like we're following the lives of celebrities mm-hmm. we will what's do what's called soft scripting and script out what we suggest the arc of the season is mm-hmm. or the arc of the episode is uh for instance on one show i worked on a celebrity host for a, a major entertainment network had to uh entertain her husband's italian family so she had to learn how to cook italian uh uh-huh. so we suggested she, they have a, they're eating Chinese food in the first scene. And the husband says he's tired of eating Chinese food all the time. Why can't she cook Italian? His family's coming to town and she's going to need to cook. Uh, All these things were suggestions by the story team Mm -hmm. necessarily moments we captured as a documentary. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this way you can, soft script the reality show so that each episode has a nice arc that buttons Mm -hmm. and the season has an arc that buttons as opposed to just chasing them around with a camera and then hoping something happens yeah uh, a lot of times it works out so well yeah yeah exactly it's a perfect happy family at the end of every episode Yeah. yeah cool so so and um and and it's funny because a lot of people think about reality as not being written um, and yet, even with soft, soft scripting, you're mm-hmm. walking in already knowing the story before it happens. Yeah, which is I actually had an interview today, and um, it was a show that they wanted to keep really documentary in tone. Mm-hmm. And I had worked on I've worked on shows like that before. I did one called Caged for MTV mm-hmm. that we kept really documentary. We didn't um, we didn't have the real people do takes, do several takes of a scene. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I made a comment. I said, you know, I worked on a reality show that was so documentary in nature that it was almost as dramatic as a scripted dramatic television show. Hmm. In other words, a scripted dramatic TV show now feels more real than reality TV. Wow. I think to, to just about every viewer is so used to fake forced reality TV shows that it's gone so far from reality. It's not even funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly can be. And, and, uh, and it, it's ironic because the, the, if you do your job well, mm-hmm. you can, you can make something totally fake look like reality. Right. And that's where being a writer and, um, and an editor at the same time, like you said, what's called a predator, uh, it really comes in handy because if you're the editor and you're not so much of a writer, you're in the edit bay with, with all the footage and you got to try to communicate to the story team what sound bites you need. It's kind of falls apart, but being an editor and a writer and being in the bay with the footage all day long, I'm able to write and create this, the story out of documentary footage as I would if I were sitting in that same room all day long with a blank page and a screenwriting program. Mm-hmm. So, so people who want to break in to this, uh, particularly from the, from the writing angle, um, mm-hmm. how would you suggest that they, <clears throat> uh, they approach it? Is it, is it good for them to, to do show, a showcase film where they're putting together their own reality show? Is it better for them to just get a job as a logger on an existing show or what, what are some of the ways that they might try to break in? Those are those are both valid ways. Uh, I came into my television editing and producing career as a filmmaker that had written, directed, produced, edited his own movies. So I jumped over the logger, assistant editor, production assistant route mm-hmm. by having made my own films. And I know a lot of guys that I edit with went the slow route. Mm. And it, it kind of they're still kind of seen as the assistant editor career assistant. You no, know, they're still kind of looked down upon as that guy is an assistant. That guy's a logger. Mm-hmm. So I think it helps benefits anyone to go out and produce their own material. And mm-hmm. I think do a lot of leverage, you know, mm-hmm. and would you suggest things like webisodes? Um, I know that uh, there's been a lot <clears throat> of discussion about uh, <clears throat> webisodes lately. Everybody loves doing them, but, they're not generally easy to make money on. <laughs> no, but um, but again, as a, as an entry point to a television career, I think until the until there's a sort of standard way to monetize webisodes, mm-hmm. I think they're a great way to develop content that could be television or mm-hmm. could be a dramatic feature film or whatever. Um, but it, you know, if you have to produce a web series for several seasons, the money's got to come from somewhere. So you're right. It it is a little tricky, but it's a great way. It's a great development tool. Mm. Very cool. Well, um, at this point, I'd love to hear about some of your other projects and that's that you make your own dollies, jibs, car mounts, other types of support gear. You've Mm -hmm. used it on your own films. Um, and you actually set up a company to, to sell it. And so tell, tell me about how that started and why you did it and, um, and how that has developed. Well, on all three feature films that I did, I had friends back in Connecticut that were like machinists and welders, and I would have them make my own film equipment. Mm-hmm. Uh, for instance, on my first feature, I made a crane, a jib arm out of, um, bicycle parts and an old weight bench. No, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it, gave me a piece of equipment that otherwise would have cost a couple thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. And instead it was just a fun project with me and my friend. So recently I've been looking to do my fourth feature film. I've written it and I've taken it through a writing group. And, um, you know, after I I didn't get a sort of studio deal out of the first three features I did, I finally decided I'll do my fourth independent feature and bought the Canon 7D. Mm -hmm to shoot it's a it's a bmx film it's a dramatic film a coming of age story set in the world of bmx street riding in new york city Mm -hmm. 
sort of like a, a Rocky or an eight mile. Mm-hmm. And in order to build an audience online for the movie before I actually produced the film, I bought the Canon 7D to shoot BMX videos for a BMX blog. Mm-hmm. But I realized with that DSLR, you it's it shoots very cinematic images, but unless you have support for it, oh, it's man. almost no good. Yeah. So my neighbor's a machinist. I took him a box of my old BMX parts, showed him, showed him what a shoulder rig looks like that mm-hmm. cost fifteen hundred bucks, and the next morning he had fashioned together what's now the Midas Mount. It's the name of the company, Midas Mount Hitchhiker Shoulder Rig, mm-hmm. and eventually started selling them to my friends. I started selling the shoulder rigs and a slider we made on Craigslist. Mm-hmm. A retailer got a hold of my equipment. That was EV- EVS this, online? Yeah, EVS online. They, um, Someone that bought my gear brought it into their store. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and they, they loved it. They loved the price point. They, I worked with them a little bit to develop the gear to get it to um, you know, look like a retail product. Mm-hmm. And before you knew it, we're in the business of selling camera support gear. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, so um, I mean, obviously you can't, you can't share exact numbers, but is this the kind of, are they the kind of numbers that could finance your, mm-hmm. your film work? It could, you know, maybe in another year or so, mm-hmm. it, uh, it makes about half of the money that I do working in television full time. Mm-hmm. And because DSLR is such a craze right now, and uh, I have access to machinists and a machine shop. It, it was just kind of a no-brainer. I didn't set out to make a camera support brand. I set out to make an independent feature film. Hmm. And then I set out to make a BMX blog to build an audience for that film. And I bought the camera and, and built the shoulder rig for myself. But friends wanted one, and I just uh, I just couldn't pass up the opportunity. Yeah. Well, and, and let's talk about that a little bit. Um, why is this significant when, when you started making your films at the end of the nineties yeah. and then compared to now mm-hmm. when you can go out and buy this Canon 7D for a couple grand? Yeah. Um, and why, why is it that these, these sort of things that you, you can, you can buy for, for peanuts really? are changing the landscape for independent filmmakers? Well, for instance, the first feature I did on a 16 millimeter, an Airy SR3, 16 millimeter film camera. And, um, you know, any traditional, most traditional film cameras will ha- will give you that cinematic look. Mm-hmm. Where you can get the shallow focus, uh, shallow depth of field. You know, for instance, now you can see me and the curtain behind me mm-hmm. and everything sh- in sharp focus. But in a, in a dramatic feature film, the curtain typically would be totally blurry, mm-hmm. right? Separating me from the background plane. Yeah. Traditionally, with uh, with video cameras, that's been hard to achieve. On uh, my third feature film, we shot on a, a standard definition video camera that had a um, a lens adapter that allowed us to to get that shallow depth of field. Hmm. Right. But still, the the video camera was a twenty thousand dollar item. The wow. lenses were very expensive, but now with DSLR, the promise of DSLR is you get that shallow depth of field cinematic look where you can make what looks like a Hollywood movie with a $2,000 product. Yeah. The problem is these things were built for still photography, mm-hmm. right? It's a little camera like this. It's not a nice, heavy, ballasted camera that sits on your shoulder. So if you're trying to shoot a dramatic scene... After 30 seconds, your hands start shaking. <laughs> so, yeah. so does the image, right? Been there, done that. So that that's why when I bought the Canon 7D, I'm like, this thing's awesome. But it definitely needs some kind of camera support. Mm-hmm. And um, that's why the camera support part of the DSLR industry is just as big as the camera side of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, but but at the same time... Um, everything, it, it's really affected everything because, um, when I think about the, even mm-hmm. the tripods that we used for these cameras eight, 10 years ago, the mm-hmm. tripods had to be so big and heavy and strong because the cameras were so big. Right. And now that the cameras are so much smaller, um, it's, it's, it's created a lot of opportunities for smaller, cheaper 
gear simply because it doesn't have to be as robust. Well, you're right. You can achieve the same production value now with a fraction of the cost in terms of equipment. The problem is, like I mentioned with my um, business model for the movies, Mm -hmm. that sort of brick and mortar video sales and rental business has gone away. Mm -hmm. And so many more filmmakers are shooting feature films or shooting television pilots because the equipment is so much more accessible. Mm -hmm. So it's great in terms of it's sort of democratizing filmmaking, but, um, the, the rewards are sort of, sort of been dissipated. Mm. You know, there's, there's not that $10 million deal at Sundance anymore, typically. Um, so it, it is great in that it allows anyone and everyone to become a filmmaker. That doesn't necessarily mean that anyone and everyone should. <laughs> you know, that, that's what comes back to writing. Yeah. I'm, I'm so insistent on writing groups. I won't read and cover someone's screenplay unless they've developed it in a writing group. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Unless so, so writing is so important, especially now that everyone can be a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Who's got the best story? Yeah. You know? And so, so do you uh, actually evaluate other people's stuff to, to produce and direct yourself? I have a friend. Um, it's his website is 60 buck, 60 buck script or, I have, I'm sorry, they don't have the act, the correct website, but he mm-hmm. covers, he's, he's covered over 10,000 screenplays wow. and books for the studios. So when friends of mine ask me to cover their screenplay, I'll, I'll say absolutely not. <laughs> but, but I will for $60, you can have my friend Scott cover it, who's mm-hmm. a professional script, co- you know, he does professional script coverage. Yeah. So, um, you know, I just think in this day and age, writing becomes more and more and more important. Mm-hmm. And and just um, from your perspective, having done several features now, working on your fourth, what what are the the key elements of a story that are going to make it stand out? Well, character. You know, I think it all comes down to character, and then having some sense of structure. A lot of times, filmmakers will have a great idea for a character and no structure, or a lot of structure and no character. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think. Uh, I guess it's a, it's a balance of both, but again, it's with my first feature film, the first screening, we sit in the theater, there's 300 people there. Uh, A lot of my friends and relatives, the lights go down and it's terrifying Yeah, sit through that 90 minutes when there are long stretches where no one laughs, Uh no one reacts. And that's so easily remedied by taking, by rewinding two years and taking your screenplay into a writing group. Mm. right because you can have everyone reads the characters and you see when you get the laughs and you'll see where the problems are um you know i think like pixar people that are so great at story they beat story to death they do table readings pencil tests animation tests and you know they test the story to death Mm. before they actually put it on film yeah rather than spend Mm -hmm. 10 or 20 grand shooting something and then having it end up on the editing floor Right, writing. I can't rec. I can't recommend writing groups and script coverage enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very, very cool. Now you're you're launching something else, and uh, I think <clears throat> it'll be today that we can call it today because that's when the podcast will be released. Uh, tell mm-hmm. me about what you're launching. We're launching a new follow focus system called the Snap Focus, mm-hmm. and what it is, it allows you to control focus on your camera, typically a, a DSLR like we've been talking about, that's on a, a shoulder rig or some kind of handheld support, and you control focus at the grip level mm-hmm. with a set of brake levers. And so it's Whereas, a set, so they work so, uh, one way and then the other way? Right. It's totally mechanical. There's There's no electronics or servos, so it's... It's really intuitive. It's almost as if your brain is connected to the lens of the camera. Mm. One pull of the lever one way will drive the lens from infinity to macro. Mm. And one pull of the lever the other way will drive the lens fully back the other way. Uh, because we offer it with a set of inter- interchangeable gear ratios mm-hmm. so that no matter what kind of lens you have, you can drive the thing all the way with one pull of the lever. Whereas traditionally you'd have to reach up like this to to dial the, the mm-hmm. focus. Up. Well, that's, that, a, that's that's really really cool. I I know because I've I've uh, worked with a number of different focus yeah. systems, and 
um, the the camcorder style rocker, you you can't rock focus that way because um, you don't have a feel for exactly where each focus point is. Right. There's knobs. Right. That, that you turn, but again, depending on, uh, like, it's very hard to judge. Yeah, um, you can't. That's why we called the snap focus. We thought that name was appropriate because mm-hmm. you can, you get that mechanical feel for it, and you get that intuition about, you know, where, where all your brain and your body and the camera lens are totally in sync. There's not that lag that you have in, in electronics. Mm-hmm. No, you're totally in sync with the lens, and you can snap focus to it, and you'll you'll get a feel for exactly where each point is. Right. Again, with the example of the curtain, if mm-hmm. we had such a shallow depth of field that you could only see this much of, of focus, you know, like six inches, mm-hmm. it snap focus from the curtain to my face in a second. Very, very cool. Yeah. And uh, and so now there was there was something about a Kickstarter thing that was happening. We're we're launching the the Snap Focus project on Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. Um, we're still a young brand of camera support equipment, and we don't have a ton of R and D. And just like writing, uh, writing, directing, producing an entire movie, and then showing it to an audience to see if it works or not, uh, you know that that that's. A pretty huge risk in mm-hmm. the same way for us to spend years developing and producing thousands of units of this snap focus system and then release it to the public it, it would be such a huge risk that our company would probably get crushed mm-hmm. so with kickstarter we can bring this to filmmakers and we're basically pre-selling the snap focus units mm-hmm. and we'll we'll offer them in subsequent production runs Mm -hmm. so that the filmmakers who get the first small production run of the snap focus act as our sort of real life, uh, beta test. Okay. They'll be able to swap that unit out for the new and improved version later if they, if they'd like to. Mm. Mm -hmm. Very, very cool. And Mm -hmm. how long is the Kickstarter uh, campaign going? It's going to run for a month Mm -hmm. and, um, for 30 days and within that window of time you'll have the opportunity to buy a snap focus system we don't know after that there'll be a long period of time before they're at retail probably next year Mm -hmm. so it's an opportunity for filmmakers that really want to try something very new and very cool and very different and we think it's a system that really fulfills that helps fulfill the promise of DSLR Mm -hmm. It turns a still photo camera into a movie making machine. Well, and, and I, I do something I, I I notice about your products. Um, I mean, even the modest mount, the the slider mm-hmm. um, is uh, you can I I can tell by using it that it's been de- designed by somebody who spends a lot of time actually using this stuff. <laughs> Yeah, like like I I could tell you're um, a filmmaker and you know what you need as a filmmaker as compared yeah. to um, an engineer who says I think I can figure out what a filmmaker might need. Yeah, you know there's there's a wide variety of products out there and, and with DSLR because uh, some of, some of them come from the still photo industry, some of the slider product mm-hmm. products, and some of them come from the video industry. But real filmmakers who've been on a real film set and know what it's like to toss around real sturdy film equipment, uh, that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. It also makes a difference to your clients that show up on set if you're the filmmaker for hire and they show up and see all these like trinkety video and, uh, you know, photography tools. Mm. We, we wanted to make equipment for DSLR that looked like real film equipment just scaled down for a smaller camera. Very, very cool. And they can find out about all of this at MidasMount.com? Yes, that's right. Go to MidasMount.com and uh, stay tuned for our Kickstarter launch and the release of the Snap Focus. Very cool. And there's links to all the Kickstarter and stuff at the at the website? Yeah. When the Kickstarter project launches, the Midas Mount links will redirect to our Kickstarter page where mm-hmm. you can pre-order the Snap Focus follow focus unit. Very cool. And now, um, will this work with all different types of camera? Like, say, for instance, I have a Panasonic GH2. Will it work with with that? 
It will work with any camera that um, has can take a lens gear, has a fixed lens, mm -hmm. and any standard 15 millimeter rod based system. Very, very so cool. So where, where any other follow focus unit would work, the snap focus will also work. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think we're coming close to the end here. Oh, and you're on Twitter as well? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, our tag is uh, Midas Mount. Midas Mount. Yep. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so just beyond that, um, anything else that you want to promote? Uh, no, nothing else to sell today. I hope everyone finds <laughs> a snap focus and, uh, you know, makes our little company Midas Mount that started in my garage become a, a real thing and help me uh, and everyone else make more movies. Yeah. Well, and, and you know what, Bren, I, I have to say you've um, – You've got a great example. Um, I haven't actually heard of anybody who's said, I'm going to make three features in three years. I mean, the fact that you could, I mean, it, for a lot of people, it's it's an achievement just to make one, and you yeah. made three in a row. I mean, that well, already is is quite a feat. Thank you. You know, you said it that uh, I was an example. I stole that whole model from Robert Rodriguez. So. Oh, yeah? That would be a great piece of advice for me. I mean, I literally made notes in his book, Rebel Without a Crew, mm -hmm. and that was his plan. So I, I can't take credit for it. I stole it from Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. uh, it worked out a lot better for him than it did me. <laughs> but uh, yeah. but still, it worked out, you know. And um, that would be my advice is like role model another filmmaker's career, mm -hmm. role model another screenwriter's career, and, and look at what they did and how they got in and who they met and, you know, sort of uh, – what they produced and uh, just role model someone that has succeeded and ignore the word can't. Yeah, exactly. Very cool. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. I, I, I really uh, think you're doing great stuff and I can't wait to see this, this next feature when, um, so you're going to shoot it next year. Well, right now the snap focus is our big project and mm -hmm. we plan on shooting the BMX feature called ride next summer in New York city. Next summer. Very cool. We'll be yep. watching for it. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, friend. Okay, well, thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye. Right. Cool. That was my interview with Brandon David Cole, and now my mini-interview with EBS Online. Enjoy. So this is Gray, and I'm here with Robert Magnus from EBS Online. How are you doing, Robert? Doing well, Gray. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thanks. And I really appreciate you coming on the podcast because I know it is production season and the audience of this podcast is primarily people trying to break in to the TV and film industry. Many of them are doing so by shooting indie webisodes and showcase films and that kind of thing. And why don't you tell me what EVS is what you and what you offer to the indie filmmaker? Sure. Um, EVS is, well, we're a brick and mortar store, but we're also a an online retailer as well. Mm -hmm. But a lot of our speciality comes in the fact that everyone there is a shooter. We're, we've all been in the, we've all been in the industry a while. We've all been doing this a while. And EVS is kind of the day job. Meanwhile, after the, after hours, we're able to either help people shoot stuff, hired out to shoot stuff, shooting our own stuff. So we're very much in touch with what's going on out there in terms of webisodes, TV production, film production, independent movie production, Everything, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, anything and everything. And now that cameras are getting cheaper, our, our, our experience is broader and more people seem to be looking for us and looking for a lot of the stuff that we do. Mm -hmm. And and so why don't you tell me now, when you say brick and mortar, um, is it just in Los Angeles and, and whereabouts in Los Angeles? Uh, it's in Glendale. In We're, Glendale okay. uh, yeah, it's just a little bit of a suburb outside of L.A., uh, right on the Glendale and Burbank border. A lot of people think that we are Burbank because mm -hmm. we're near the studios. We're not too far off. But we've got a store there. We sell cameras. We rent cameras. We sell audio gear, grip gear, lighting gear. Uh, and on top of that, nine times out of ten, we end up teaching you how to learn, how to learn it. I can, can you tell I've been doing homework <laughs> with my daughter? We yeah. teach you how to use it. And we also, you almost get a free education by coming in, which can be both good and bad for us because sometimes it eats up a lot of our time. But that's also what sets us apart is mm -hmm. that when you come in, we're able to give you, we're not selling you just 
any camera. We're we're selling you our experience. We're mm-hmm. selling you our you know, our hard earned experience. I would say. Yeah, and and then you also do sell nationally and even internationally. And uh, and I understand that over the phone, you can offer a lot of the same kind of wisdom as well. Yeah, yeah. It's not usually as easy over the phone, but yes, we can, and mm-hmm. we do it very regularly. Okay, so so um, talking about some questions that somebody might be facing. Uh, because a lot of people are are setting out to do this kind of thing for the first time. Um, they they hear about webisodes or maybe they see webisodes out there and they think, well, I could do that. Um, but then it's it seems kind of daunting um, when when you look at all of the the gear that's out there, especially with NAB coming uh, just a just a month or so ago and all this new gear that's out. Um, what would be sort of your recommended gear for somebody who's starting out? shooting a short film or, or webisodes on a limited budget? It, you know what? It really depends what the budget is. If mm-hmm. you're starting out with anywhere from $1,000 or less, at that point, you could do it on your iPhone. Mm-hmm. And there are wide-angle lenses and there are cables and adapters you could do to use your iPhone. Um that's probably more like in the $500 range. Moving up from that $1,000 to $1,500, you can get a camera from Best Buy and we can give you one or two little accessories to go out there and kind of get it. But what happens is no matter where you start, you always find what your shortcomings are. Mm -hmm. And personally, as well as just your technological shortcomings. And we then become every step of the way as we watch people grow. I mean, I've got customers who started out by, by buying a uh, $1,200 little Canon Vixia, and now they're buying, uh, you know, like AF100s and Canon HDSLRs and lenses and packages, and they're, and they're growing it. That's only in four years. Mm-hmm. That's a really quick growth for a lot of people. But uh, for people who are starting webisodes, it just really depends what your budget is and what your look is going for. Because I have people who start with the $2,000 or $1,000 little HD camera, but then I also have people who come in and they get the Canon 5D Mark II or the 7D or the 60D or the T3i, start investing in lenses, start kind of getting to know how that whole mark or how that whole shooting process works and then moving upwards from there. Mm-hmm. And and when when is it right to rent or buy or finance? Um. Rental is if you're planning on just doing it for a quick job here or there. Mm-hmm. So maybe you buy, you can afford the camera, but you're, you know, you're going to do some kind of organized shoot. So you're going to need lights because it's all indoors. So you rent the lights. Buying lighting can be very expensive. If you're doing a lot of outdoor stuff, you don't think you need it, then that's why you don't buy it all the time. You rent it a few times here and there. But the real goal for most of this now is to just buy, mm-hmm. buy the camera, buy the audio gear. Nine times out of ten, though, the funny thing is the audio gear, the lighting gear, the grip gear will last outlast your camera by six times probably. You'll buy six yeah. cameras before you replace any of that other stuff. Yeah. But the camera's so important. You need to kind of spend all your money on that to begin with. Um, it boils down to every situation. But usually what you'll end up finding is that you at least want to start by renting your lighting and grip gear and then slowly building that up. Mm. Uh, but definitely start out with a decent camera. I would even say start out with a decent camera and the best audio possible. Mm. Because if your audio is trash, no one's going to watch your video and everyone's going to destroy your video because they can't hear it or it just sounds like a poor video quality. Yeah. Or it sounds like poor audio that makes the video look even more poor. You can have substandard video and amazing audio, but you cannot have amazing picture and substandard audio. Well, and and I think that that is a really really important point because I I I know that a lot of us you know we're on Twitter we're on on the internet and we and we hear the you know 5D is used in this film and and it was on Captain America and I gotta get one I see it at the Best Buy I can get one of those and and so we you know you have a a four thousand dollar budget and you buy a thirty five hundred dollar camera you can afford one lens with that and no audio and mm-hmm. uh, and and there's not a balance when meanwhile i mean i shot i shot with vixia cameras for years that's a you know about a thousand dollar range great cameras sure it's not m- maybe the same resolution but you can do a lot with that camera that's certainly Absolutely. good enough quality for webisodes or, or things that are going up on youtube and then could spend some money on something like a, a zoom h4n or okay. or something like that for for audio um so I, I think that it, it is very important to not just look at the internet 
but to be able to get some wisdom from, like you said, people over the phone or walk into the store and and get some get some advice on an entire kit and what can your buddy buy, right. including, say, for instance, if you have a DSLR, what's the use of a DSLR if you yeah. don't have a few lenses that you can use for different situations? Well, uh, yeah, and that has a lot to do with it. There are a lot of I get a lot of people who come in who have very limited budgets and. I try to, and they're going, well, I want the 5D and I want, but I need to do all this stuff. And usually I'll say, well, have you looked at the, maybe the T3i? The 5D, if you wanted to get it with the lens, is going to cost you anywhere from 2700 to $3,000 now. Well, a T3i with two lenses, you could go to Costco and get for $800. Mm-hmm. The lenses are mediocre at best. They're, they're decent still lenses. They're, they're not very good video lenses, but they will work Mm -hmm. and they will begin the process. That way you can get the camera, the lenses, but more importantly, you can get the Zoom H4n. You can get a shoulder rig to hold it because these cameras don't have any support. So you've got to do stuff like that. Um, but yeah, and, and that's what we specialize in. I really don't sell the T3i at a very good deal. Like I said, you could go to Costco and get it for $800. It's just one of the consumer deals that Canon has worked out with other consumer areas. Mm-hmm. But I don't mind. I'm, yeah. I may, be, at best though, the, here's the secret. And actually, this isn't the secret. This is the truth. Most retailers make maybe 10 to $50 of profit on a Canon product. And that's, that's nothing. Mm-hmm. That barely keeps the lights on, if at best. We generally break even on Canon. Um, and if Canon is watching or listening, maybe it wouldn't hurt to help us out. Uh, <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, I don't care if you go buy that that small of a camera it's somewhere else. But you come to us and you can learn how to use all this other equipment. And that's how we keep our lights on. That's how we keep the knowledge flowing. Mm-hmm. Better yet, we're still very competitive out on the market. And even better yet, we're not gouging you. You know, we're, we're here to help. We're here to give you the best deal possible. Um, but I'm also here to say, no, you don't want to get the $500 guy, get the $200 because it'll last two to three years and you've already made your money on that. And then you move up. Mm. Whereas there are other times where it's, yeah, that's 200 bucks. But if you spend three to 400 now, you'll save it and you'll never buy this again. Yeah. So that's what we really try to specialize in. And we, we cater from everything to the beginner all the way to the pro. I mean, right now I'm putting together a TV show for um, a yet I cannot name internet streaming place. Uh-huh. Uh, May 22nd, keep an eye out on the news. You'll, you'll know the show that I'm working on. But it's one of their own produced shows, internet streaming only. It has a good star attached. And they're using high-end cameras. I mean, they're using $10,000 cameras. But then... They didn't need to. They, I showed them a few options and brought them in the range from, you know, anywhere from like 5,000 to 20,000 and then showed them all the different options that are there. And I mean, that's all we really do. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's what we like to do because we're all doing this ourselves every single day. Yeah. And, and I know that there are are a lot of myths out there. Um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I don't have any affiliation with Canon. So I can say this. There is a Canon myth. Um, there are other cameras out there that are, are, uh, more inexpensive that that uh, are really competitive with the kind of image that you get from them. So, absolutely. I mean, if the funny thing is, the Panasonic GH2 mm. has so much more that it can offer to a person if they're very savvy. Mm-hmm. Um, so, somebody like me or somebody or some of the people that come into my shop, they like the GH2 because they can hack it. Yeah. They could go online, figure out how to get into its brain, unlock uh, variable frame rates, unlock higher megabits per second so there's less compression. The funny thing about it is, though, because it didn't blow up, there isn't much support gear that matches it, that fits it perfectly. Mm. Canon has the benefit of being so popular that all the support gear was made for it. So yeah. that's just one of the challenges that it that it presents. I've actually seen a guy take a Canon little Allura the little consumer camera. He Mm -hmm. hacked, he found a way to hack it. And by hacking it, he opened it up so that it's used. The sensor is not too far off from a 5d, but it's just the chip, the processor inside is less. Yeah. He hacked it. And on a wide shot, you couldn't tell it was different from a 5d. Wow. So that that's, it's not something I recommend everybody, but what he Mm -hmm. would do is he'd put that on top of his 5d, use that as a wide shot and then use his lens as a tight shot. Yeah. And you really couldn't tell that he wasn't shooting with a 5D. There's all kinds of cool stuff you could do out there. And yes, there are other cameras you can use. 
Uh, it depends what price range you're in. I mean, Canon, you can't beat the HDSLR. Mm-hmm. If you go with Panasonic, their GH2 HDSLR, very cool, very useful. You just, you need to be a little more savvy when you're using it. Mm-hmm. Um, then moving up from that, I mean, $5,000, you got a Panasonic uh, AF100, which I think is an amazing camera. Mm-hmm. And now Canon's got a whole line of other cameras out. Sony has a few, uh, JVC. I mean, everyone's got a camera for a different use. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and of course you can always rent before you buy. Um yeah. to uh, to help mm-hmm. just to make sure that you know everything from the ergonomics to the the way the 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 function of the ca- functions of the camera work uh, work for you. But um Yeah. So uh and one last thing I wanted to talk about was uh, uh we actually in the same podcast uh we had Brandon David Cole on and and of course he oh, does cool. the Midas mount with with you guys and and yeah. I I really love that you guys um work not only with you know the 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 big name china built products but you get homegrown stuff as well uh, tell me a little bit about that um we're pretty much open we are open to anybody bringing their product in and saying look what i made or look what i have do you guys have a market for it and you know if it's priced right and it provides a really good service absolutely brandon came in with something that was in the right market at the time of fighting a, a 300 to 400 dollar slider or little dolly uh, they were all over the internet how to build them, and they mm. were building them using components from Redbox machines, which uh-huh. is actually pretty cool. But he came in and said, "No, here's a better option." And then he keeps building and building and building. When somebody, you have a clever person like Brandon who's got a cool engineering sense, and by the way, a great editor. So anyone who needs to hire him, please do. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's also out there doing some really cool stuff with it, and we and he's just a cool guy. We've had a lot of fun working with him, and. Um, hard to beat a cool guy like him uh mm-hmm. his product is excellent it can work in so many different ways and he keeps creating new stuff <clears throat> we see everything i mean we see everything from the the two dollar item to the thousand dollar item to the hundred thousand dollar item and if we think it's got a place and it's at a right value we'll sell it we'll we'll push it we'll love it but there are some products that we either feel are overpriced or we really don't think our clients are going to use then we kind of, we tell them, we tell people who bring that in. And if they like, if they don't like that, great, they can move on. If they do like, if they like it and they want to keep working with us, they can, you know, we can work together and we try to help out. Mm-hmm. So I mean, we, it, it's fun. Sometimes we see some real good stuff. Sometimes we see some trash. <laughs> cool. Well, I think that's all the time we have, but uh, I did want to mention your, your website, evsonline.com has a gear rentals guide, has contests yes. and lots more. So definitely people want to check that out. Yep, definitely. Uh, like us on Facebook. We're giving away one of the uh, Schneider iPro lenses. So definitely do that. We're always giving away something on at least Facebook and follow us on Twitter, uh, EVS Glendale. So easy to find. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Very cool. Well, thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. I can usually tell the difference between when somebody's using a, an effect in Photoshop and actually using a lens that creates blur or creates focus effects. So aesthetically, I think it's more pleasing to create it from a lens. And also creating it on site in camera, um, it just it has a way of clarifying your vision and making the images stronger, I think, because you're creating exactly what you want at the time on site. So I like the Lens Baby products because they're they're different and you get to play with blur and focus in different ways that you, you can't with other types of lenses. I've enjoyed that a lot and I enjoy the range of different optics that they provide because you can do so many different things with them and create different looks, have control over blur and focus in different ways. And these new lenses that are coming out I think are really exciting because they expand the potential for photographers and the arsenal that we have to work with to create the images that we dream of and want to make reality. I really love working with focus and being able to tilt and shift focus and the ability that gives me as part of my visual language to focus the the viewer's attention on particular areas in an image. I also like the fact that I can control the blur and control what's out of focus and I think blur and things out of focus are oftentimes just as beautiful as things that are in focus. So those are Um, Reasons that I use different lenses like lens babies or a tilt shift lens or a view camera. 
for different series that I work on. I'm really excited about the Edge 80. I've been asking for this lens for a long time from Lens Baby because it's a way for me to work with a digital camera and create effects that I could only previously create with a 4x5 or a lens of that sort on bigger cameras. So we can create two different looks with the Edge 80. We can use it like a normal lens and just focus it parallel to the digital sensor, or we can tilt it and use that slice of focus within the image to uh, create blur or create focus on particular areas in the image. With a tiltable lens, we can tilt the lens around and so our focus plane also becomes tilted at an angle. And so that allows us to focus our attention on particular areas in the image, say for instance on the eyes or a piece of jewelry. Um, it also allows us to create blur and create really beautiful effects with blur that we couldn't if we were working uh, with a straight parallel lens. With the Edge 80 we have three controls for how we can control the focus. So first we can tilt the lens and shift that um, plane of focus at an angle. The second control we have is working with our aperture by adjusting the aperture to say to f22, we'll have a much deeper depth of field at that angle. Or opening it wide to 2.8, we have a really shallow depth of field, a really beautiful blur coming off the edges of that focus plane. And then we can focus the focus ring and move the plane of focus in and out, or forward and backward within the image as well. When you're working with a tilt and shift lens, you have to be real careful about how you meter things and how you expose your image. Because as you tilt the lens, the meter in the camera doesn't read the, the light properly anymore. So I'll frequently shoot, and then I'll check my histogram on my image in my LCD screen to be sure I have the proper exposure, and then I'll shoot some more and test it again. It's also really important that you bracket your exposure, and I also like to bracket my focus because it sometimes it looks like something's in focus and you're just slightly out of focus. All right, we turn around to your right a little bit. Good. Using selective focus is a lot of fun, and it gives us a lot more creative freedom in how we we focus an image or blur out particular things or focus the viewer's attention on particular parts of the scene or the clothing or the jewelry or the accessories or the face. I like Lens Baby's products because they expand the, the possibilities for my imagery. So I have more tools to work with to create more interesting images and to create something a little different. I think the images speak for themselves. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web.